Anyway, yeah, so uh, I'm here with uh, Chad Cudigan. Is that how you pronounce it? Yep, Cudigan. That is how you pronounce it. Cool. <laughs> really, names are not my uh, my thing. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. if you want to give a little introduction. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm the programmer and game designer behind the game Delver. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just um, basically just going to ask, like, how did that start, really? Yeah, uh, Delver started, I think, oh, God, maybe in 2012, maybe a little bit earlier. It seems like a long time now. Of, uh, like, I've been playing CRPGs, computer role-playing games, for the longest time. Like, I grew up playing action RPGs like like Diablo and, um, like, uh, all of the Elder Scrolls games, all of those first-person RPGs. Like, the, the first time I was over at my cousin's house and he showed me this game, like, Daggerfall, where you could go anywhere oh, yeah. in the world and, like, you go in every single door and, like, live your own fantasy life, basically. Like, it just blew my mind open. Like, oh, that's amazing. So I've always had, like... I always had the idea, but in the back of my head, like, oh, yeah, I want to make a game like that, or like like Ultima Underworld, like all of these cool dungeon crawlers that, that I grew up playing. And I, I started dabbling around in game development. Like, I got the original Android phone that came out at the time. I think I got a, a Droid 1 with the cool, like, slide-out keyboard. Oh, wow. And I was playing this thing, and I was like, hey, this this thing can do 3D graphics, and there there are no... There's like no games for this yet. This could be a cool platform to make something. So I made like a little arcade Geometry Wars style game called Tilt Arena, where you would tilt to drive your little spaceship around, and it'd always be you'd always be shooting in this arena battler. And after that came out, it's like okay, I can do this. So then the next thing I wanted to do was like, oh, I'll make a dungeon crawler. That should be simple, like. Mm. Uh, and then that ended up taking five years or more. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe maybe not the uh, the best idea if I want to do something quick and easy. Mm, yeah, I Daggerfall is. <sighs> you see, I have a uh, a strange history with games because even though I'm only nineteen, when I was four, my parents bought me a Sega Mega Drive uh, because I was really right. into Sonic at the time. And that introduced me to like the world of retro gaming, and I ended up latching on to quite a lot of just older systems and older games on PC. And it's funny because I talk to people who are actually more akin to my dad's age about games and stuff, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I grew up with that. How did you grow <laughs> up with that?" And Daggerfall was one I played quite a bit as well, and. Recently, they, I don't know if you know about the Daggerfall Unity project. I've tried that out as well. It's, that's really Wait, cool. Uh, Interkarma's project, right? Uh, I no idea about the development team or anything. Or... No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I overlapped with those guys a little bit uh, back in, when I was in university because I was, I was like working on tools to, uh, to read in the Daggerfall dungeon layouts and display them on screen. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, so there was a community of people back then, even like in the 2010s, working on like, oh, reviving Daggerfall. Wouldn't it be cool if, if like we could run Daggerfall in an open source engine? Yeah, and like nothing really came out of it at that time, since everybody was young and had no idea how to work with each other or in a big project. But uh, it was it was a cool scene, and I think working in that made me realize like, oh, I can't do a game as big as something like that. I need to do something <laughs> a little more like focused. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of like kind of where Delver fell out was like, how about I just make a game where you're just going through a dungeon? Like what if it's just a game like Rogue? Like Rogue was the first roguelike game. You're just there you don't pick your character class. There there it's pretty streamlined. Like you're in a dungeon, you fight some monsters, you get to the bottom, mm. try to get this orb. Like that seemed it seemed doable to take that game design, that roguelike style of game, and just make it 3D and maybe get it that 
type of game to an audience of people that maybe wouldn't have played like an ASCII text character based roguelike. Uh, so like I was playing also a lot of games, a lot of net hack and that style of like ASCII roguelike. And I really liked those games for being super deep and complex and all of the weird things that would come out of the systems in a systems driven game like that. But it takes a really hard time to be able to look at that game and go like, Oh yeah, I'm going to play this game. That's like, <laughs> 40 by 40 characters and not play something with my like $200 graphics card that I just bought. Yeah. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to try to bridge that gap there and like bring my lug of my love of roguelikes to people that maybe would never play them. Okay. And uh, now like at the time, nobody was really doing anything like that. Like the first lo- looter shooters were starting to come out, but nobody was like doing first person roguelikes. And then they kind of like blew up somewhere along the way where now roguelike is people hear roguelike, they're like, Oh, another roguelike. (laughs) Uh, uh, But at that time it seemed like such a cool novel idea. It feels like for ages, it was just the only roguelike that really got any attention was the binding of Isaac. And it was just like, yeah, that's what defined roguelikes back then. And I'm yet to play anything like rogue or (sighs) I think, to my understanding, is like Dwarf Fortress similar? Yeah, Dwarf Fortress has like an adventure mode that is uh, pretty, pretty roguelike-y. Yeah. Uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup might be a better place to start these days, I think. Yeah. I, or actually Brogue. Brogue is probably the most distilled, like, amazingly playable version of a roguelike you can play these days, and it's somehow even pretty, even though it's just like... <laughs> colored ASCII characters. It's super fun, though. Yeah, because I, I think the main the main exposure I've had to a lot of roguelikes currently is I obviously I play tons of Isaac. I've played a hell of a lot of Enter the Gungeon. Mm-hmm. Um, just those kinds of games. They, they, they were really sort of the standout ones for quite a long time. Even though, yeah. like, because when it comes to Delver, I, I played it on my phone back in the... I think when it became a paid al- uh, alpha. I think... So that's way back then. Yeah, I think it was 2013. I remember because it was my first year of high school and I play it on the bus to and from high school. And um, I just have this just vivid memories of just constantly trying to get through. And I, I never really beat it on mobile back then because, I mean... I just wasn't great at games, and also it was mobile. <laughs> yeah. It's harder to control. And at the time, I just had no idea it was even on PC. <laughs> yeah, that, it's an interesting kind of history about how Delver started that way. Like, like I said, like it started out as a, as a game for Android phones because there, was no, there were no Android dungeon crawlers really back then. Yeah. And I wanted to play one, so I thought like, oh, well, if I want to play one, I bet other people also want to do that. And I think there's a, I think this thing can pump out OpenGL graphics fast enough where to do like a pretty simple dungeon crawler, but still something you could like sit down and play through. Uh, I think it eventually ballooned to the point where maybe it was not easily playable in that platform anymore. There was a, there was a point where where we had to make the decision, like, do we keep making this game as a mobile game or do we, do we bite the bullet and then go, okay, maybe, maybe it's actually more of a PC game at this point than it is an right. Android game. I'm guessing that's why uh, development shifted focus to PC overall. Yeah, uh, I think it kind of happened in a weird way. Like uh, Steam Greenlight was the way for indie developers to get on Steam back then. Uh, besides like knowing people in the industry or like, or like somehow winning the, the game lottery and getting on steam some other way. But, uh, yeah, green light came out and somebody that was playing, or I don't, I don't know the actual story behind this, but somebody who had been, I guess, playing the game. Oh yeah. Josh I don't know on what this. platform. Yeah, but like <laughs> somebody uploaded uh, Delver to Steam Greenlight, and yeah, we didn't do it, so we were like, "Oh crap!" Like is somebody trying to take our game from us. Uh, so we we like got a hold of 
we talked to Valve and like got that one taken down. But in the process, we're like, maybe we should put our own up then. Like clearly somebody wants this. There was there yeah. was like actual votes behind that initial one to the point where it seemed like, oh, people do want a game like this. Hmm. Uh, so we, we put up our own Steam Greenlight page and we ended up getting getting greenlit in one of those uh one of those first initial batches there, I think. Uh, and yeah, and that that was like the start of Delver being a Steam game and not just like a little mobile hobby project. Yeah, I mean, going back to the Android side of things, like how was it being like one of like a really early indie dev on that market? Was it? <laughs> it was very lonely. Uh, there was no scene. Like Google clearly did not give a crap about games really too much. Like they they yeah. clearly care more than somebody like Apple does about games. But like the scale of game you had to be to even get on somebody's radar at Google had to be huge. And I was like, I was I was a pretty small game. It was selling fine on the Android store, like more than I ever thought it would. Like people were buying it, playing it, and engaged, which kept me engaged working on it because. Like I'd see what the community wanted as a feature and I'd just go back and build it, push out a new build and see how they liked it. That was kind of how that initial uh, loop got started there when I was working on the game. But besides the community, like uh, like there was no, like nobody ever officially reached out to me from uh, from from the Google side or or like anybody even more in the industry. So it was pretty pretty grassroots at the time. Okay. Yeah, I, I know but, you said um, a lot of the influences were more like action RPGs uh, from the time, but mm-hmm. there is a specific series of games that Delver honestly just it feels like a roguelike version of almost in a, in like the best way possible, and it's like the Heretic Hexen games. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely like a gap that we bridged of of we like a games like Ultima Underworld where you're just dungeon crawling and exploring but the combat in those games usually sucked and yeah. as like 90s kids we were like Josh and I were pretty well versed in the uh the language the design language of games like Doom and Heretic and Hexen and grew up playing all of those games and uh knew those like the back of our hand. So I guess it's no surprise that a lot of that, uh, a lot of influences from those games ended up in Delver. Uh, like as the game went farther and farther on, I think a lot more of those elements started to seep in, it, especially around the magic system. Like the wands in the game are basically like heretic guns. Like uh, yeah. it says wand, but that's that's basically a machine gun. Especially the, the uh, like the gun. weaker magic missiles that have more charges. Yep. Like yep, like completely. The, the ice wand is basically is basically a shotgun. Yeah. The fire wand is basically like a rocket launcher. Like yeah, uh, it just it worked out super well. Mm, yeah, I, I, I think there were some unique items in the game too that evoke items from Heretic. Uh, and Hexen. I'm just not sure which one's offhand. Maybe Joshua would know. <laughs> yeah. So, when you did, like, obviously, the alpha is very, very different to uh, the final game. Not necessarily mm-hmm. entirely in mechanics, like, because obviously, the alpha still very much feels like Delva. However, yeah. the obviously the style changed completely, drastically overhauled. When was it decided that you'd actually take that step and completely change the look of Delva? Yeah, that was actually a scary step. Um, I think like there was a thread about the game's development on Tick Source that was where a lot of the community feedback was coming from where I'd be uploading new builds for people and people would be playing them and giving feedback. And uh, it just happened to be like the way I was shipping that game was just a Java jar file, which is, mm. is essentially just a zip file with the game assets inside of it. Yeah. So oh, people started still opening them up. Them and, on the uh, Delver wiki. I don't know. If oh, you what's know, that? You can still download them on the Delver wiki. Some of them actually 
are still accessible. I don't know if you know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I have seen those around there. I think I downloaded one once just so like I would keep one, I keep an older build around just for my own personal uh, <laughs> vault as you yeah. will. Uh, yeah. And so people, people were opening that up and like modifying the game and the graphics were super simple at the time. They were, like a, I think a player character or a monster character was maybe 16 pixels tall at the most. <laughs> uh, so people started messing around in there and asking, asking for, oh, it, is there a way that uh, the game could just dynamically scale everything based on the, the texture size? And I was like, oh yeah, I think I could do that. So I added support for that in. And people started making these little texture packs, which were pretty easy to put together. There were only a handful of monsters and not not a ton of animations, so it's not like they had to yeah. go through and like make 30 different animations for an attack. It was basically like frame one and frame two. So uh, people could get in there pretty easily and, uh, and make their own art for it. And a couple of people put out art packs, and I guess it was showing, kind of showing the limits of my programmer art and uh, how much better it could look if I worked <laughs> with an actual artist and wasn't just doing everything on my own. And uh, Joshua ended up being one of those people that uh, made made a texture pack. But yeah. the interesting thing about it was a lot of the other people that were making these texture packs were going for a totally like grim, grim, dark style, uh, mm. like sometimes very detailed. And the feeling that Delver had even at that time was not not that it was, yeah. it was a little less serious even at the beginning. And so it kind of fit. He had these cool sprites that reminded me of characters from like river city ransom from the and from the nes yeah which is a game i played a ton of and something about it just clicked with me and i i knew that that like oh this this seems like the way forward for for delver if we were if we were ever going to take that step i mean it looks amazing i mean as much as i love the alpha i yeah the the the, the new art is just it, it just looks really, really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty night and day. The, the build that took the game from the art that I had to the game, the art that Joshua had was, was uh, such a huge step at the time. Yeah. Like, I, I remember I coded this feature where I could press keys to go back and forth from the old art to the new art. So I, I could take before and after screenshots and I would just run around the world going like, this is what it looks like now, and now it looks like this. And it was immediately, it, it was immediately a better game for it. Everything looks so much more, more. Uh, I don't want to say detailed, more, more alive. I think. Yeah. It, it felt like it felt more like a world you could get lost in. Okay. More immersive. Yeah, more immersive, but not in the way of like. Uh, uh, I yeah, know, like, I, I know what you mean. With, like crazy graphics. And... Yeah, I mean, immersion doesn't always stem from realistic graphics, but the atmosphere created by them. So... Yeah, I think a good art style gets out of the way of the game. It's something that draws you into the game because it's, it's inviting or something about it clicks with the viewer and looks aesthetically pleasing, but it also needs to, to get out of the way of the person playing it and be readable enough for the player to understand what's going on and give enough feedback so that when the player does something, they know like, Oh, my action had an effect. Like I, I hit a monster, the monster should do something so that you know that your attack hit like it. Yeah. Uh, and, and some art styles are get so busy and there's so many like particle effects and things flying away. It kind of gets in the way of the player reading that feedback of what the game is actually doing. And that, I think that's when a game gets, feels mushy. Yeah. Like um, Nintendo is really good at this. You take an action in, an, in a Nintendo game and they give you immediate feedback that's clearly readable on the screen and oh, yeah, just yeah. enough and doesn't get in the way. And yeah, they, they know when to stop and exactly how much to give it. And I think that's why Mario still feels good right now. Like Breath of the Wild, which has taken... It's place is one of my favorite games of all time. It has just <laughs> mine too. This the combat isn't necessarily really 
like it, it's not super in depth. It's just at the end of the day, just swinging and shooting and casting like spells with mm-hmm. wands. But but the feedback that you get, it's so satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely, I I have. I have slowed down footage of games like Breath of the Wild just so that you see exactly what's happening when Link hits the monster with the sword because there is, it looks simple, but if you really dig into it, there's like six layers of things happening yeah. on top of that. Like like audio cues, multiple layers of graphical effects. Like the game might slow down a little bit. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's it's pretty neat how much work it is just to to make your game have good feedback like that. Yeah, because I've seen some games they even they even like freeze for a frame or like stuff like that. Just to yeah. just to some <laughs> games can do it well, and and there's another game that that does do this um, called Spark the Electric Jester Two. And oh, what's it called? Spark the Electric Jester Two. Uh, no, I haven't. There's the, there's two games on Steam. The first one is a two D sprite based game like 16 bit graphic style it's fantastic the game is really good however it's it's long as hell there's like 14 mm-hmm. zones it's mm-hmm. crazy and c- because of the style and everything people are like oh i can sit i can do this in one sitting like sonic the hedgehog 2 no you can't <laughs> um yeah. but the second one was completely 3d and they um the developer put this like you know that 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 sort of thing in where it freezes for a frame, and sometimes when you defeat a boss, there's like a ton of explosions in it. It lags on every explosion, and sometimes it can be a bit too much. <laughs> it then feels like real yeah. lag. Yeah, you you don't want your feedback to start getting in the way of playing the game. Of like, oh yeah, come on. Yeah, a- eventually it does start to feel like, oh, is this is this intentional or is the game slowing down now because the hardware can't keep up anymore? Yeah, and don't get me, they're, they're fantastic games and they're incredible, incredible platformers, and I recommend them to anyone. But yeah, <laughs> some some that's like the one thing that is noticeable about it. I think the the opposite of a game like that would be something like Morrowind. Uh, I, like Morrowind, Morrowind's one of my favorite games. Daggerfall is also up there, but combat in both of those games is pretty <laughs> uh, unresponsive. I would mm-hmm. say, like, you can sit there and you like whacking the guy with your sword for ages, hoping a hit comes through, and you hit a guy, and like maybe a blood splatter appears, but like none of the enemies really ever react to getting hit with the sword ever. Those, those uh, early dice roll systems are quite punishing. Yeah. Yeah, Delver has a little bit of that too, uh, which in retrospect was probably also a bad idea. Uh, but I think it's something the game, it's only a problem, I think, it maybe in the beginning of playing the game. And as you level up, that goes away pretty quick. But if I, if I was going to go back and make some big changes to the combat, uh, I would definitely remove, remove the two-hit roll and find another way to not stunlock a monster because it... It still does feel bad to to be right up in the face of a monster like that and swing and not have it get hit. Yeah, uh, I think I was uh, trying to hold a little bit too closely to being a roguelike, which is a trap. Those other games also fell into of oh, we're a role playing game. You need to be rolling dice in the background. And, yeah, because uh, it turns out you don't always need to do that. But it kind of gets in the way of being a computer game if you're trying to do stuff like that. It feels like back then they were trying to emulate. Well, obviously. The- the point of the Elder Scrolls, especially with the first game, was, to my knowledge, to basically have a a virtual experience of D and D without the need mm. of friends and a game master. <laughs> right. Which is, yeah, when you when you break it down to its very core aspects, that is exactly what the game is. Even down to a lot of lore and things like that. And, yeah, and they so- definitely kept some of those mechanics that maybe could have been pushed aside. Daggerfall is maybe the game I've played the most that is the most an- antagonistic to the player. Like, the game really works hard against you oh, to yeah. fail the game in a way that you can never come back from. Uh, 
and you might have spent 100 hours in the game up to that point. And then, oh, you didn't read the quest text enough. You only had 30 days to do this quest. You didn't get there in time. This The, the next main quest NPC is, is gone and will never show up again. So, oh, there's no way to beat this game. But you're still playing, I guess. So go have some fun. Which I think is why I never made it anywhere in those games. I played those. I played Daggerfall a ton as a kid, so a lot of it went over my head, like it was just too deep for me. Mm. Uh, and one of those things was was the main quest. I, I never really got very far in it, but uh, just doing all the random quests and doing uh, going through the random dungeons is uh, a memory that kind of stuck with me forever. Yeah. Again, the Unity project is actually really good on that because you have options to tweak the combat and make it act like later entries in the uh, series. And even some <laughs> of the quests awesome. and stuff, there's just like patches and quality of life fixes and all that kind of thing. It's a really awesome experience. Yeah, I keep going like when I'm less busy, I want to definitely sit down and play that game and play a playthrough of Daggerfall to the end. And, uh, I say that about Morrowind as well, and I think it might be a while before I <laughs> ever get the chance to do <laughs> they're that. They're very big games, yeah. Yeah, they're very big. Nowadays, I, I look at new open world games that are coming out, and I go like, oh, there's there's no way I can play that game. That's going to take way too long. I would I'd much rather play a game that is a good experience to sit down and play for a half hour than... Uh, so then some game where it's like, I need to spend 15 minutes looking at the map just trying to figure out what the next thing to do is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you say that your favorite part of the game was to work on for Delver? Or not, not necessarily mm. maybe part, but maybe even just period of time that you worked on the game? Yeah, I think there's a couple, there's a couple of notable times. I think the first one was when... I was working on just the movement and the basic, uh, like getting getting collision to work in and getting the player movement to feel right. Like that was all super fun. Just there's something about a game when it feels good to play, and it was good to try to tr try to replicate that myself. I spent ages just running around tweaking the values of like the acceleration and the slowdown and how fast you, how fast can you move when you're falling through the air? If you press the key to try to change directions and, Oh, you're in the water now, how much should the, the water slow you down? And like, mm. if you toss an item, how far should that go? How fast should it go? Like that, that early time when, when it was just like the basic building blocks of the game was really fun to work on. Uh, yeah. Like adding the first monsters in the game and getting them to chase the player around and uh, to to be smart enough to chase the player, but also also to be simple enough where I could toss like a thousand monsters in the map if I wanted to and not have the game slow down. Like that was all that was all super fun. But it's always more fun when you're going from nothing to something than it is yeah. going from something to something plus a tiny step. Like uh, once you have the once you have the building blocks in place, everything from that point on is like just adding coats of paint on top. And it takes a, a lot longer for those coats of paint to add up to anything substantial. Yeah, I, I get that when working on my own projects. Like I, Whenever I start a new game idea, I feel so, I feel, I feel so motivated. And it's like, yes, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get a ton done on the first day, and I do. And then I get all the basic mechanics down. And I'm like, okay, now I've actually got to start building the game. And I'm just like, oh, God, now I have to start building the game. It's so overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> it's that meme of, like, now draw the rest of the owl. Like, it's basically... The second phase yeah. of de development is basically that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, uh, talking, like, of the movement of, when, of, of the character and stuff, I noticed... The main difference I noticed between the current release on Steam and the alpha is that strafing would allow you to go way faster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like that's, if that's if you're moving rookie, diagonally. That's a rookie developer mistake. Yeah, it, it uh, just reminded me of games, like again, like Hexen, where you can do that. Yeah, yeah it's because those games, they're just... Any, any game that has this problem is usually because 
the, the input system is usually something like, oh, you hold down forward, so you move the character forward this much. You hold down right, so you move the character right this much. Yeah. So if you hold down both, you go that direction, that speed, and this direction, that speed. So it means you can go diagonally like super fast, when in reality, it's like, no, that should be more like you're on a circle. So you should really define where that would be on the circle between them if they're holding down both of those. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I ran into this issue when I was... Uh... When I when I was working on a sort of like shoot 'em up, uh, shoot 'em up type mm -hmm. game, and I was controlling the ship, and I got the analog stick controls down because I I made it so you can use both uh, the D pad and the analog stick, so you could use classic eight directional and analog stick. But the analog stick it was fine because it was all just based on the angle. When mm -hmm. it came to the D pad, there was the issue of the diagonal movement, and it was the exact same. Mm -hmm. It would go way faster. And then I, I, I looked at videos and tutorials and stuff, and they mentioned the exact thing you said about the circle. <laughs> yeah, like mapping it onto something like a virtual joystick is usually much better. Uh, that's something that we fixed later on. So people don't run diagonally through the whole game <laughs> and use that to jump around gaps and things. Yeah, I did find myself, because I, I went back and got footage of the alpha, because I'm, I'm covering parts about the alpha as well. and. Uh, yeah, I found myself moving diagonally most of the time. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it is funny when you watch a speed run of a game, and people have even started doing some Delver speed runs, and uh, it is heartening in a way to watch them playing the game mostly as it's meant to be played, and not like like rubbing themselves up on a wall the right way, like in Doom, <laughs> to get a giant speed boost. Uh, yeah. But at the at the same time, those the bugs like that. That that people somehow clue into and and find are are really neat sometimes. That even even fixing bugs like that, you're like, oh, maybe I should keep this in because people like doing it, or or yeah. sometimes it just means oh, maybe the player character should just be a little faster if they want to run faster like that. Yeah, um, I used to also speed run some games. I I. I used to speedrun Rayman 2 on PC, and I mm -hmm. I did uh, Sonic Mania briefly when that came out. And Rayman 2 is such a... It's an early 3D game, so it's broken to high hell. <laughs> if you jump... <laughs> it's if you, kind you, of fun in a way. It is really fun, and, and the annoying part is I, I ended up stopping because there was a lot of parts where RNG was... Well, it was near RNG. Because there was a glitch in the game where if you paused on the exact frame you respawned, then it can completely break some triggers in the game. So certain bosses, certain like chase sequences would despawn, but you had to get that. And it's just... Like pixel perfect? Oh, yeah. Frame perfect? Yeah, frame perfect. And <laughs> they, they found ways around it now, but in the end I just I, I couldn't do it anymore. It was so annoying because <laughs> so many things would be in it's your control focused. until you got to that point then it's just good luck <laughs> yeah and yeah i, I and think you were probably playing for your 15 minutes before then so you could just throw those 15 minutes away pretty much um <laughs> it, it, the worst part is it was about 40 minutes into each run sometimes yeah when I, when i look at stuff like that i do think that Certain bugs are okay to keep in as long as like, this is just me if I was developing my own game. I think if it's not a common issue that the regular players would not run into, then maybe it's okay to keep because <laughs> speed runs can be very interesting with glitches. And sometimes I've seen games that just die in the speedrunning community because sometimes a glitch was patched and it's just not fun to watch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, some, yeah, some games are fascinating to watch speed runs of because they people can get out of the maps and suddenly they're jumping on invisible collision traversing the map and that's that's pretty much that's mind blowing to watch. Uh, yeah, for something like Delver, I don't know if it's a great game to speed run because it's so random. Like you could get you yeah. could get a tiny dungeon floor, or you can get a huge dungeon floor, uh, like. 
people would have to get really lucky to get a fast speed run of that game sometime. And then like you could just you just die and uh all of that <laughs> progress is gone too. Yeah. Like when it comes to the alpha, why would you like you personally, why do you think that some people like myself are often still drawn back to it to this day? Even like not necessarily prefer it over the current release, but just mm-hmm. Because it has such a different feel to it, and and, and I've drawn yeah. many parallels with um with this game to say, like Minecraft and its alpha, like mm-hmm. at their core they are the same game, and they still function very similarly. But there's there's something about it, you know. I I, I <laughs> producing like writing the script for this video in particular. It got me thinking about the Minecraft Alpha to the point where I started playing it, and I even was was trying to get all the content for this video. I made another video on Minecraft without commentary, just mm-hmm. just as like a little reflection on the Alpha, just like getting little clips of gameplay to that sort of emulate people's first experiences with the Alpha again. And it was just it's so different. I wouldn't say it's better. Yeah, they both like, they both have their own place in a way. Yeah, I think it's 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 also fascinating to go back to an earlier version of something. Like a, a lot of game development feels like you have a, a big like like you're making a sculpture or something. You have, you have a big block of stone and you're you're chipping away at it to see what game is inside of it, and uh, and it also feels a little bit like as you're as you're making a game, you're it's you're always making decisions about about which direction to bring the game in. And sometimes sometimes you just you're you're making your your best educated guess about what is the best thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so I think sometimes it's it's fun to go back and look at like look at a game that's maybe a lot less polished, a lot more janky but also has a lot more open possibility space and go like, oh man, wouldn't have been cool if they'd gone in this other direction instead. Uh, and as you work on a game and the closer you get to finishing a game, the more you're kind of, the more you're, you're killing the idea of it in a way because uh, all of those other cool things that you thought that would be fun to do, you kind of uh, put those ideas to bed and, and, Tell yourself like, oh, maybe I'll get back to those someday in a different game. So it's kind of like bittersweet at the end of making a game because you know, you know, there's there's so many more cool things that you could have done with it uh, yeah. if if the game would have gone in that way, or if you would have had more time, or like a thousand other ifs. Yeah. Uh, but you you go back to an er- earlier version and. Yeah, it's just less polished and and has more room for you to to kind of fill in the gaps for yourself. It's like why reading a novel is still fun. Yeah, the, it's leaving a lot more for your imagination than like watching a movie. I think. Yeah, and like dr- again, drawing another parallel to Minecraft. Even I mean, I mean, one they they kind of shed the same sort of space for me back then as well because. Mm-hmm. I was playing both of games, like I was getting into both games at the same time. And nowadays, it's amazing because both games have options to revisit the exact version I was playing back then. <laughs> back then. And I always appreciate it when game developers do this because it's nice to preserve what once was. And having that option to just switch back and forth any time is just, you, it doesn't have to stay a memory which is what I love because then mm-hmm. if I really want to get a hit of nostalgia, I don't, I don't have to watch old archive videos or, or just again, memories. I can just play it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't really get the opportunity to do that with a lot of games either. Most games are not built in public from day one. Like not really. Yeah. Um, most games, like uh, the the uh, sorry, I'm trying. I'm just trying to think of how best to word this. But 
like games are not known historically for being a medium that cares about their past. Yeah. Y- you hear about games all the time where people would love to 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 release the source code if only they had it, but nope, oh, I guess I guess all the assets were on like one guy's computer and uh Jim left the company and formatted his hard drive and I guess that stuff's <laughs> gone forever like the 80s and 90s was not great for for uh, game preservation. Yeah. Uh, even big studios like Square Enix like have to they can't put out re-releases of games they would want to because it they have to make the whole game from scratch basically. Yeah. Uh, uh so it it is cool to to just be ha- to have every aspect of development out in the open and uh have people be able to see the work. Like those those early builds are playable but are pretty rough. Like it's more of a more of a neat historical curiosity than uh than a cool game to play yeah. probably. But I'm I'm glad that stuff is out there. Yeah, it's like it's strange because you say that about companies in the eighties and nineties, but one company that keeps on the the prototypes keep on leaking out of, especially over the past couple of years, is Sonic. The 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 yeah. so a beta for the like a prototype for the first Sonic game was released a couple months ago now, <clears throat> and it's a beta or prototype that people have been looking for for over a decade now. They found screenshots of it everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's only just leaked. About a year ago now, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 prototype leaked, which turns out, because later releases of the game on PC, they changed the soundtrack because of rights issues, and people were like, oh, why did they do that? The originals were better. Until last year, that's what people believed. Turns out in the prototype, all that music is there on the Mega Drive which has never been seen before. Mm -hmm. And now people are realizing, oh, they actually redid the music and then like for the full release and then put the old music back in the later releases because of rights (laughs) issues. And there's just, there's just prototype after prototype leaking out of Sonic team. And we don't know how, but it's amazing to learn all this stuff. It is pretty fascinating. Like even, I've I've worked on a handful of games now, and I've worked through game. I've worked through them in the period in the beginning, where there isn't a whole lot of game there. Like a lot of games, kind of gel and come together in the last last like ten minutes of development. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways, uh, having access to early like super early prototypes to a certain point is not super beneficial because there's just nothing there yet. But at the same time, I'm super fascinated when anything comes out like that. Like the the, the Zelda 64 leaks uh, that are coming out pretty recently are also pretty mind-blowing. Like I never thought any of yeah. this stuff would ever see the light of day. And it's so wild to see some of this stuff to like, oh, these screenshots I saw when I was a kid of Link standing next to this house. Like that's all there was. There was no other game than that. They had a Link <laughs> they could move around in like one super basic house and they took a screenshot of it was like yes this is marketing material and there was no other game to play it's it's so wild to think like that would even be interesting but it's still cool to look back in this and go like oh yeah this this game that was a, a seminal piece of my childhood initially at one point was just like link in a small box with another small box that was uh, supposed to look like a house next to him. And that's all there was. It's that same kind of thing of like, they could have taken this game in so many other directions, but in the beginning, all they had was like this. (laughs) Yeah. So with Delver, I know that obviously you've moved on to many different things now and even bigger projects and as far as I'm aware you're even working on what Torchlight 3 is it? Yeah Torchlight 3 was the last thing that I worked on. Yeah okay do you think that even though you know you've now like mostly moved on from the game do you think that there is any space for any future content updates for the game? Delver there's still 
there's still a lot of things that I wish I could have added added into Delver, uh, especially just like just the like more more secrets, more more hidden content in the game, side areas that are that you don't have to go into that that you could go into if you wanted to to kind of push your luck a little bit. Uh, I don't know if if I will be the one to add that into the game or not. Um, right. Yeah, I I think it, it's that it's the push and pull between like there's there's a bunch of cool stuff we could do with this game, but also like being able to being able to walk away from a project at a certain point, I think is really good for, for your mental health. Yes. Uh, and and to give you room to kind of noodle on something new. I, I was definitely burnt out on the Delver project at the end. Like when that final update came out, we really pushed to hit it. And at that point, like it, it took a while to get back to the, the space of wanting to work on another game like that in my, in my spare time. Delver was always made in our spare time while yeah. we had other full-time jobs. So it was basically eating up any nights and weekends that we could give to it that we could steal from our from spending it with friends and family instead. So uh, it was nice to be able to like sit down and read a book after that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that said, like I do get the urge now and then to go back and add new things to it. And a lot of that has been now spent by like open sourcing the Delver game engine. So more people can go look at it and see how it was built. And even yeah, mess with the code themselves if they wanted to like i feel like like the best thing i can do for the the longevity of delver and making sure that people can continue to play it is to is to make the the software behind it open source like otherwise otherwise like games just atrophy and and die unless the community can make it work on their own yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was going to be my next question about the open, uh, making the engine open sourced everything. Uh, I think it's really, it's really nice to be able to see that because I know a lot of developers don't do it, and uh, yeah, I get their reasoning. And a lot of them have good reason to not, you know, make their entire engine open source. Mm -hmm. But for those that do, it opens up so many possibilities for the modding scene and, um. Just interest in the game in general can be prolonged. I mean, with any game that releases tools or their engine, especially with Valve, uh, they're, they're, they're huge on that. It just, I mean, just take a look at Left 4 Dead, for example. That game the, any is source game. still, well, yeah, but like, especially left for dead modding has preserved that game and to the point where the community has formed around it released a content update at the end of last year that added a brand new campaign and it's it's just nice to see that sort of thing because even if a game won't get content updates anymore you can always rely on the community to keep on pushing out like even like dlc worthy content a lot of the time because some mods can can make a game like some games are just famous for mods i mean oh yeah They're like like the arma games so many genres of games have come out of those that aren't just like battle royales uh mm -hmm. zombie survival games like that game is more of a toolkit in some ways than it is a game on its own like it's uh, it's it's kind of amazing to see everything that that comes out of a community when you just give them the tools to to work on the things that they think are interesting, um, like uh, and and also, I think it's useful for the next generation of game developers. I, I got my start of uh, making maps for Unreal and Quake. Uh, that that's how I got started, and that was because they shipped those tools. I don't know how I would have started any other way uh, if people didn't put out the tools that they they use to make their game. It's just not a thing that 
triple A games do anymore. If you yeah. want to, if you want to to add levels into a game, like your options are pretty limited at this point. Yeah, it's like with my first year at university. Um, oh, uh, my! I think my computer is going to die pretty soon. By the way. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I'll make this fairly quickly then. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I guess, is there anything specifically you want to say to like fans of the game or people finding Delva for the first time? Uh, I think just thanks for playing. I, I never thought it would catch on in, in the way that, that it has. Um, it just started with me sitting down in a coffee shop in a small town in North Dakota, uh, wanting to make, uh, wanting to make a video game. And, uh, the fact that anybody's played it still kind of blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, if anything, like, I think it shows that people can make things like if you, if you sit down and spend the time on it, people, people can, can do amazing things. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to say thank you because it's a huge inspiration. Like it's part of it's, it's games like that, which really made me want to get into making my own. And I know I speak for a lot of people when I say that developers, like especially like just small indie developers, just like you, where it's just mm -hmm. like one or two people making games is just huge, hugely inspirational and makes us realize that, Hey, we actually might have a shot. <laughs> in this in this market but yeah yeah and the the best thing that i've ever heard anybody say about delver is like oh your game was an influence on me for things that i'm working on like that that, that blows oh, yeah. my mind <laughs> I, I i i really really love delver and I'm not pretty i i think i have like one friend who who knows about it but to me, it, it, again, it, it's, it's it made a lasting, niche. it made a lasting impression all those years ago, and it still does to this day. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> That's great to hear. Yeah, and I also want to say thank you for taking the time to talk to me about this. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I understand that you're a very busy person, so it's even more appreciated. <laughs> no problem. So yeah. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, my, my computer's like, your <laughs> computer's going to go to sleep if you don't plug this in right now. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you once again. And um, Yeah, this was, this was fun to do. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 look, I look forward to seeing uh, the final video. Yeah, I'll... Uh, I'll send it to you over Discord or Twitter when I when yeah, it's done. Either, either way is a good place to get a hold of me. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, thank you. And I guess I'll be heading off now. It's yeah. past midnight now for me. So. Oh yeah, yeah go to bed. <laughs> Sleep. Yeah. It's like four in the afternoon here. It's much easier. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. See ya. All right, see ya.